Welcome to the program, Integrating Emerging Evidence in Adjunctive Therapies, the Team-Based Management Strategy in Type 1 Diabetes Maladies. My name is Dr. Robert Henry, and I'm Professor of Medicine at the University of California, San Diego. I will be your presenter for today's program. My disclosures are listed here. This program is sponsored by North American Center for Continuing Medical Education, LLC, an HMP company. This activity was supported by an educational grant from Santa Fe US and Lexicon Pharmaceuticals Incorporated. The learning objective of today's talk is to recognize the negative clinical and socioeconomic impact of poor glycemic control and the barrier to achieving the recommended levels of A1C in patients with type 1 diabetes. Secondly, to evaluate the efforts to achieve glycemic control using available antihyperglycemic agents as adjunctive therapy, insulin, in type 1 diabetes. Third, to describe the latest clinical data surrounding uh, the efficacy, safety, mechanism of action, and benefits, limitations of current and emerging SGLT inhibitors in type 1 diabetes. And finally, to develop a multidisciplinary care strategy, a sort of a team approach, that consider the role of SGLT inhibitors in, uh, to in ad, adjunctive therapy to insulin in patients with type 1 diabetes. This first slide comes from the type 1 exchange data, uh, which is an open um, website, publicly available diabetes innovative uh, website, which looks at a number of features of type 1 diabetes. This slide shows A1C, mean A1C, in a large number of patients as a function of age. In patients enrolled between the years of 2010 and 2012, and currently shown in red. On the vertical axis is the percentage of A1, mean A1C percent. As you can see, the, there is um, evidence that A1Cs are most well controlled in the very young, the ages of less than six, and in the older populations, 26 to 50 and greater than 50 years of age. Um, with the less optimal control in teenagers and early 20s, 20 years of age. Note that there is not a great um, benefit in currently in the A1C percentage across the ranges, uh, despite the fact that A1 that continuous glucose monitoring is um, has been uh, increasingly utilized in patients and has not translated to better glycemic control in the current population in contrast to those um, studied in from the 2010 and 2012 population. This looks at the percentage, this slide looks at the percentage of subjects achieving a target A1C of less than or equal to 7%, which is the generally accepted goal for most patients with type 1 diabetes. As you again can see, it's broken into in the gray in those subjects enrolled between 2010 and 2012, and those currently enrolled is shown in red. What we can see is that uh, the numbers of patients achieving those of less than seven, the goal of A1C of less than or equal to seven, is highest in the very young population and in the older population. And with very, but again, with very little improvement this in the current population compared to the previous population, despite the significant advances in monitoring and uh, efforts to improve glycemic control. 
This next slide looks at the percentage of subjects who are overweight, which would be defined as a BMI 25 to 27, and those, uh, and those who are obese with a BMI of less than 30 kilograms per meter squared. Note that you can almost draw a straight line from the youngest age group through to the oldest age group with a progressive increase in uh, the percentage of subjects who meet the criteria of being overweight or obese. And these numbers have not changed um, significantly between the current enrollers and those previously enrolled. So this continues to be a major problem which is not being addressed very adequately in the type one population. This is the frequency of severe hypo, hypoglycemia by age from the type one diabetes exchange website. They define um, hypoglycemia, severe hypoglycemia as the seizure or loss of consciousness in one or more events in the preceding 12 month period. And generally it requires, it requires the assistance of another individual. As you can see, the highest incidence of severe hypoglycemia is in the youngest age group, which makes sense since these individuals can be newborns through to young infants and children who are most likely to um, have the greatest difficulty recognizing impending hypoglycemia. Um, in contrast, if you look at the ages from 6 to 13 through the ages of greater than 50, the incidence uh, or the percentage of, of individuals affected by um, severe hypoglycemia is low and consistent at one to two percent. This is the frequency of diabetic ketoacidosis according to age. And again what you can notice is DKA is most common in the groups of less than six years of age Oh, sorry, less than six years of age through to 26 to 50 years of age. Overall, the percentage is about 4% and ranging in the highest groups between 5 and 6% generally from less than six years of age through to 18 to 26 years of age. That's in the range of 4 to 6%. It appears that the older age groups 26 to 50, uh, 50 to 50 to 65, and over 65 have the lowest frequency of diabetic ketoacidosis uh, compared to the younger age groups and overall. So what we can see, this data tells us, observational data from uh, the type 1 diabetes exchange data tells us that there's a number of unmet needs and challenges in type 1 diabetes. First of all, the limitations of insulin therapy alone are very clear. Most type 1 diabetics are using either intensive insulin therapy or continuous subcutaneous insulin infusion are not able to achieve the recommended levels of glycemic control. Near, gly near normal glycemia can occur in a few individuals, but often at the expense of great efforts and, um, and with the risks of hypoglycemia. Chronic hypoglycemia, high glucose rather than, it persists in most individuals. The A1Cs that you can see are generally not in the range of 7% but higher. And that we also notice from continuous glucose monitoring that there are wide fluctuations in the glucose levels and variability of insulin responses to stress and nutrients, unpredictable mild, hypo, um, mild hypoglycemic episodes and often severe hypoglycemia. Progressive weight gain, as I, we, we looked at, is progressive over the years. Although we didn't see it, there's an increasing frequency of late cardiovascular disease. And diabetic ketoacidosis, particularly in uh, the younger age groups, remains a problem. And adjunctive therapies are needed to aid and improve 
MDI, multiple daily insulin, multiple dose insulin, or the continuous subcutaneous insulin infusion options. So adjunctive therapies in type 1 diabetes are, ne are sero sorely needed. More stable glucose profiles are needed rather than these wild fluctuations, wide fluctuations that can occur. An improved time in the, in the optimal range would be uh, are certainly necessary. Less hypoglycemia, less weight gain. But this is not at the expense of trying to replace or significantly reduce the insulin dose per se. So what do the patients and the, or the providers want from adjunctive therapies. Essentially what you want to do is to optimize the glycemic control, get the A1C down to 7% range, um, or if, better, if possible, even better, but without hypoglycemia, and particularly without the severe hypoglycemia, this intensive insulin therapy is often associated with progressive weight gain, which you do not want. So these, um, these adjunctive therapies are, um, are, are therapies that can be used together with insulin to hopefully achieve some of these goals. I should tell you that of virtually all of these agents that we use as adjunctive therapy in type 1 diabetes are approved for use in type 2 diabetes. So a fair bit of experience with their use in individuals with type 2 diabetes less so with type 1 diabetes, but they're not approved, but used off-label, most of them. The only one that is, um, we'll take a look at them, but the only one that is approved for use in type 1 diabetes and type 2 is the inulin analog, Pramlantide. The Pramlantide is the only FDA-approved adjunctive therapy in patients with type 1 diabetes. It's indicated for use with mealtime insulin therapy um, in patients with type 1 diabetes and type 2 who have failed to achieve the desired glucose control despite optimal insulin therapy. It's difficult to match the insulin therapy to the glucose absorption with meals and, and the nutrient absorption with meals. The mismatch is very common and leads to hyperglycemia or at times hypoglycemia, but certainly um, less than optimal uh, glucose levels before and after meals. Prontlantide, I should note, does have a box warning regarding the development of severe hypoglycemia, and that has significantly limited its use uh, in patients with type 1 diabetes. So how does Prontlantide work? Well, it's an interesting hormone that is produced by the pancreas, co-secreted with insulin. And pramlantide is a, uh, an analog, a synthetic anal anal analog of human amylin and has much of the same effect that, pramlin that amylin would have that in our body. It has activity in the brain, which modulates satiety, makes you feel full much more readily when people take the uh, pramlantide at the time of insulin injection. Uh, it uh, also leads to decreased caloric intake because of the satiety increases. It has effects on the gastrointestinal tract, primarily to slow gastric emptying. That re results in re slowing of the absorption of nutrients uh, and um, and to affect the prevailing glucose levels. And thirdly, there's a liver activity effect, which reduces the postprandial rise in plasma glucagon. Glucagon being the primary uh, hormonal regulator, along with insulin, in the production of glucose by the liver and the utilization by, uh, and along with insulin, the uh, production of of glucose by the liver, uh, especially following meal ingestion. So let's look at a study that was uh, published 
2003, it looked at the effect of Kremlin tide in type 1 diabetes, it looked at the postprandial glucose rises after chest meal using comparing individuals with type 1 diabetes that um, were managed with either regular insulin or with rapidly acting insulin lyspro. And as you can see, this is the incremental glucose um, value after the meals. This is with placebo shown in gray and following co-administration of pramlantide shown in red. And what you can see is that with regular insulin, the marked increases in postprandial glucose, incremental glucoses after a meal are markedly blunted by uh, 60 micrograms of pramlantide so that it, it has a dramatic effect to reduce postprandial glucose concentration. In individuals with using Lifepro, 60 micrograms of pramlantide co-administered with insulin uh, again, markedly blunts and, in fact, um, perhaps uh, incre it, in, it decreases the um, postprandial rise even more than regular insulin. And you can see that this is probably uh, at, puts patients at somewhat risk, at greater risk of hypoglycemia. So the, the titration of the insulin doses to the pramlantide therapy with meals uh, needs careful monitoring to prevent, uh, to, to not only reduce the postprandial rises, but make sure that they, uh, that there's not an excessive blunting of the rises that leads to hypoglycemia. So pramlantide is an adjunct to insulin therapy in type 1 diabetes. This is uh, a study that looked at um, a group, a large group of subjects, uh, that they were on stable insulin doses. They looked at different doses. Placebo is shown in gray. Pramlantide, 30 micrograms, subcutaneous three times daily, or 60 micrograms, subcutaneous three times daily of pramlantide. Taking a look at subjects on stable insulin doses, you can see that the, the uh, reduction in A1C percentages were, um, were shown here. And with pramlantide, the two different doses of pramlantide, substantial reduction in the A1C therapy. And a similar, although somewhat greater, with pramlantide 60 versus the 30 micrograms subcutaneous or two times daily. This is in contrast, patients who are on stable insulin doses tended to do much better than patients than all subjects in this subject in this study, many of whom were not on stable doses. They got a benefit um, of the pramlantide compared to placebo, similar with both doses, and less pronounced than in subjects on stable doses of insulin. So there were some benefits. This is pramlantide in type 1 diabetes that, that uh, looked at the same study, which looked at other changes. For example, looked at changes um, at over the 26 weeks of study with 30 or 60 micrograms of pramlantide three or four times daily on uh, compared to placebo on changes in A1C concentration. And you can see that the individuals getting the 30 and 60 micrograms did very well initially, but uh, started to taper off uh, somewhat by 26 weeks. In terms of changes in insulin use, the, the significant reductions in insulin use with a pramlantide at the, across the 26 weeks. And similarly, uh, the changes in body weight were significantly um, increased with the pramlantide therapy across the 26 weeks of study. This is the sum of the side effect profiles that occurred in 
the incidence of greater than or equal to 5% um, in with Kremlin tide compared with placebo. And the things to note are that most were similar uh, with placebo versus the Kremlin tide, except for an increase in nausea that occurred with the Kremlin tide, which was about more than, was two to three fold increased in, uh, in the population of from placebo compared to the Pramlin tide three times daily, and an increase in anorexia, um, a multiply a significant increase or a, a marked increase with anorexia. The other changes were uh, similar between those subjects treated with Pramlin tide versus uh, controlled with uh, placebo. So how about the other therapies, by guanides, metformin. Metformin has been widely used in type 2 diabetes for many years. And in this case, they wanted to look at the effects of, um, of metformin. But, um, and as you can see, this is a, a study that went on for uh, 20, same study went on for 26 weeks. Uh, the, daily, the total daily insulin dosage had to be at least 0.8 units per kilo per day. It was 28, 26 week study. The total in, insulin daily, the total daily insulin dosage uh, per kilo was lower in the metformin group versus the placebo group. So you can see here, there's the data at 13 weeks. Placebo shown in gray, metformin shown in red. And looking at the mean change in A1C at 13 weeks, there was a, um, a reduced, um, reduced, a reduced A1C initially in the 13 weeks, but it disappeared by 26 weeks. There was no difference between an A1C from baseline at 26 weeks of metformin therapy in these individuals. Adverse events with metformin. Metformin did have an in as shown in metformin in red, placebo in gray, about a two-fold increased incidence of gastrointestinal events, which is similar to what we might see in type 2 diabetes as well. Certainly, uh, one of the major side effects of metformin is GI uh, event. There was also a, a marked increase in um, severe hypoglycemia uh, gain, greater than or equal to one Severe hypoglycemic event was increased with metformin compared to placebo. So the um, study that was recently published and presented at, uh, at scientific meetings was the removal study, which was a study which was designed to look at metformin therapy and type 1 diabetes with a primary endpoint looking at cardiovascular benefits, particularly a carotid intimal medial thickness, but other factors as well. A1C levels, which you can see here over the six months of therapy, uh, over the 36, I'm sorry, the 36 months of therapy, uh, show an initial uh, in improvement in A1C with individuals with metformin compared to placebo, but a loss over time so that by the completion of the study, 36 months, there was really no difference in A1C. Similarly, insulin doses initially went down with the metformin, but by the end of the study, were not significantly different than placebo. And body weight went down. And as you can see, there was some uh, small weight reduction that occurred compared to placebo by the end of 36 months of the study. There was no change in carotid intimal medial thickness. And so it does not appear that um, cardiovascular benefits of metformin occur in type 1 diabetes. Bile acid sequestrant colocevalam can be used. It's used in type 2 diabetes. The bile acid sequestrant that reduces the absorption of glucose and also uh, lowers the lipid levels. This is the effects of colocevalon on A1C, um, LDL cholesterol, GLP-1 levels in patients 
with type 1 diabetes. It was a pilot randomized double-blind placebo control trial. And you can see here from baseline, it crossed over at four weeks. And the colocevalam initially showed uh, the, the percentage of patients with an A1C were beneficial, but uh, the effects were not persistent in these individuals. The citagliptin, uh, similarly, citagliptin uh, effects on postprandial glucose GLP-1 levels in type 1 diabetes uh, over a 16-week study period. Again, uh, citagliptin shown in red, placebo shown in gray. Um, some benefits that appeared uh, but uh, were not significant by the end of the study uh, in 16 weeks of study. The loraglutide, the GLP-1 receptor and uh, the GLP-1 receptor agonist, has been tried in a number of studies in type 1 diabetes. And this study was one in which they looked at uh, um, a large number of type 1 diabetic subjects, dose ranging effects of loraglutide together with insulin versus loraglutide and placebo plus insulin for 52, 26 or 52 weeks duration. The adjunct 1 and adjunct 2 study, um, the hypoglycemic DKA or hypoglycemic unawareness and low EGFR were excluded from the study. The mean study, the, the duration of the patients in the study had diabetes for 20 years. 25 to 30% were on pumps. Uh, the total daily dose was down by about 10% with the loraglutide, and the mean A1C was approximately 8%. So there were significant benefits. As you can see here, in adjunct one and adjunct two, um, the, the different doses of, of that were used um, for an adjunct one, you can see that there were substantial events, um, severe um, uh, hypoglycemia with the symptoms persisted in uh, consistent with hypoglycemia. And while it also occurred with the highest doses uh, of um, a higher doses of loraglutide, the hypoglycemia was um, a significant problem in both adjunct one and adjunct two. This slide shows the hypoglycemic episodes in detail with loraglutide. The event rate per year with placebo and with loraglutide, uh, the event rates were not uh, very high. But in adjunct two, the rate per year with placebo um, were difference in hypoglycemic, epi hypoglycemic episodes were present amongst all groups. Now the hypoglycemic episodes with ketosis, as you can see here with the highest doses of loraglutide, the 1.8 milligrams here in adjunct one and adjunct two was associated with ketosis. And, uh, and because of this, this uh, primary endpoint, the adjunct one and adjunct two results showed primary endpoint was met with a significant drop in A1C, a drop in weight loss, a drop in insulin reduction, but there was an increase in hypoglycemia and episodes of hyperglycemia with ketosis, the ragnotide not being, uh, and because of the ketosis and the risk of hypoglycemia, it was not filed for a diabetic indication type 1 diabetes. Now the SGLT inhibitors show great promise in, in the management of type 1 diabetes, but currently there are a number that are improved for type 2 diabetes, and that includes uh, dapagliflozin, empagliflozin, canagliflozin, um, 
and um, and um, more recently, uh, agents have been these agents have been examined in patients with type one diabetes. So the depict one study looked at the use of dapagliflozin in type one diabetes. The uh, study was uh, was to look at the addition of an SGLT2 inhibitor, uh, which is already approved for type management of type 2 diabetes. And the depict one was to assess the efficacy and safety of dapagliflozin as an add-on to adjustable insulin in patients with inadequately controlled type 1 diabetes. At 24, at week 24, both doses, the 5 and 10, the 5 and 10 milligram significantly reduced A1C versus placebo. The most common side effects were mild, with pharyngitis, urinary tract infection, upper respiratory infection, and headache. And the 24 results of dapagliflozin as an oral adjunct to type 1 showed that both doses provided clinically relevant benefits as an add-on to adjustable insulin versus placebo. So the dapagliflozin is a promising adjunct therapy uh, to insulin, improved glycemic control in patients with inadequate control type 1 diabetes. This just shows the, some of the results of the depict one. Um, here we have the, the patients that were, uh, this is the adjust in A1C, the and you can see the improvements in A1C. This is with placebo here, and with the two doses of dapagliflozin, you can see significant reductions of in the range of 0.6% reductions in A1C that are persistent over the 24 weeks of study. You can see here at the uh, dapagliflozin 10, shown in red, and at the dapagliflozin 5 plus insulin, significant reductions in the total daily dose of insulin. The EADS-1 study, or EADS-1 trial, with empagliflozin in type 1 diabetes was a randomized double-blind placebo-controlled trial at two sites in Austria and Germany. The doses used were 2.5, 10 and 25 milligrams of empagliflozin. The results showed um, a, uh, a lower A1C at week four, which was significant for empagliflozin 2.5. The 5.4 it was 5.4 millimeters lower for empagliflozin 10 milligrams, and 5.3 lower A1C for empagliflozin 2.5. The EASE-2 and EASE-3 trial with dapagliflozin. These were trials as an adjunctive therapy to insulin therapy in over 52 weeks in subjects with type 1. The EASE-3 was uh, 26 weeks adjunctive therapy with empagliflozin uh, to insulin therapy in patients with type 1. CGM was uh, used if in uh, two weeks before week 26, and and week uh, and week two after the 26 week period, after the 52 week period, and empagliflozin 2.5, 10, and 25 milligrams per day were compared to placebo. Essentially, a, a, across the board, with the doses, the A1C reductions were beneficial. The 2.5, 10, and 25 weight loss occurred. Increases in symptomatic hypoglycemia. There was no increase in symptomatic hypoglycemia, and no no increase in severe hypoglycemia. The only adverse event of note was confirmed DKA was uh, did occur in the two highest doses, the 10 and 25 milligrams, but not at the 2.5 milligram dose. This is canagliflozin as an add-on to insulin in patients with type 1 diabetes, uh, essentially looking at uh, A1C in the, starting at the, at the range of about 8%. The reductions that occurred uh, 
uh, in these patients. Uh, you can see the reductions of uh, about 0.25% uh, reductions in A1C in uh, the canagliflozin when it was uh, using the 100 milligrams of canagliflozin or the 300. There was really no difference between them. And the changes in body weight were somewhat greater with the 300 than with the 100. So the SGLT1-2 inhibitor, uh, sodagliflozin, which it addresses both, uh, affects the SGLT2 receptor in the kidney and also addresses the SGLT1 receptor in the gastrointestinal tract. This will be the SGLT2 receptor is found in the proximal uh, convoluted tubule of the kidney and is responsible for about 80 to 90 percent of the glucose reabsorption. So when this is blocked, glucose is not reabsorbed into the circulation and will appear in the urine. Some of it will be picked up by the SGLT1, which is present in the distal tubule, um, but it's a, a relatively small amount. And this effect on the kidney leads to increased urinary glucose excretion and reductions in the prevailing glucose. But this, these agents, sodagliflozin, has also got SGLT1 inhib inhibitory effect. SGLT1 in the, in the gastrointestinal tract is the primary receptor for uh, glucose absorption in the gastrointestinal tract. And its inhibition uh, has, is to reduce uh, postprandial glucose levels. And with increased delivery of glucose into the a large bowel, is associated with increases in GLP-1, PYY, uh, and which may have additional beneficial effects. So sodagliflozin in the uh, TANDEM trial, TANDEM-1 and TANDEM-2 studies, um, the, these studies were uh, large phase three trials in patients with type 1 diabetes. You can see that the TANDEM, the proof of concept study, the phase the phase two trial, tandem four, tandem five studies are shown here. The phase three studies, tandem one, tandem two, and tandem three are uh, studies that were 24 week pivotal studies um, plus 28 week extensions and reductions of A1C and optimized on optimized insulin therapy in all of them. This shows the, um, the design of tandem one and tandem two, essentially looking at uh, 200 or 400 uh, doses. A1C was masked and these individuals, um, you can see that the results of this study show beneficial effects uh, in the pre-optimized insulin therapies uh, with reductions in A1C um, from pretreatment, um, significant benefits with uh, these two doses of uh, soda glucose. The tandem one and tandem two pooled data is shown here. Again, tandem one and tandem two were virtually the same study, one conducted in Europe, the other conducted in the United States and Canada. 200 and 400 milligrams of soda glucosin um, after six week optimization of insulin therapy. You can see reductions of about 0.43% with a baseline of about 8%. And at week 52, 0.31, uh, 0.22 and 0.31 reductions in A1C. So the soda, soda, the soda flows in tandem one and tandem two pooled analysis so optimized, after optimized insulin therapy, the reductions that occurred are shown here and compared to, uh, in comparison to placebo. Sodagliflozin in tandem one and tandem two pool data showed uh, a 
again, in two different doses, showed significant percentage of patients uh, with composite endpoints of weight gain. You can see that the weight gain uh, with soda gaflozin was um, there was no there was no weight gain in the in the patient. There was no severe hypoglycemia. Weight gain with no severe hypoglycemia and the composite of A1Cs of less than seven, no weight gain, no system severe hypoglycemia, and no DKA was again uh, more common, more frequently occurred with the two doses of soda gaflozin. So it looks that soda gaflozin was quite significantly beneficial um, with this dual uh, SVLT1, SVLT2 inhibitor. So um, the benefits in tandem one with an A1C of less than seven, um, the numbers of patients were significantly greater with the 200 and 400 of Sodagaflozin compared to placebo. And the clinical benefit, a composite of A1C of less than seven, no weight gain, no severe hypoglycemia, no DKA was achieved by 52 weeks, at 52 weeks, by 7.75, 8.89%, and 21% of patients treated with placebo, sodagaflozin 200 or 400 milligrams respectively. So there were significant benefits. The tandem three results, which was um, the uh, similar study done in patients with type one diabetes uh, following um, and saw the same kind of benefits uh, as with tandem one and tandem two with some weight loss with less severe hypoglycemia and insulin dose reductions, some reductions in systolic blood pressure and DKA, just like other SVLT2 inhibitors, diarrhea and genital uh, mycotic infection, and similar results with DAPA depicts in the, the DAPA depict study. The comparison of depict one and tandem two trials shows that they're very similar in terms of uh, the DKA rates are very similar. Uh, in terms of percentages, and the differences between the treatment and placebo amongst patients were uh, very similar as well. So clearly, the use of SGLT2, SGLT1, 2 inhibitors in patients with type 2 diabetes have benefits. But one of the major problems is the development of diabetic ketoacidosis is somewhat more common in these individuals. And, and there are now suggested methods to treat um, individuals who are on SGLT2 inhibitors to minimize or prevent the development of diabetic ketoacidosis. The so-called STITCH criteria uh, suggested by uh, Dr. Gary from uh, the University of Colorado uh, suggests that, um, first of all, if a patient starts to develop uh, ketosis and it becomes significant, uh, detectable, and people should be monitored frequently for the development of ketone body, preferably serum ketones, beta hydroxybutyrate, if they start to go up, um, it's best and they hit a critical level that is concerning. They should stop the SGLT2 inhibitor and if necessary, inject bolus insulin, consume carbohydrate and to enhance hydration. That's because in individuals um, who go on SGLT2 inhibitors or SGLT1-2 inhibitors often um, reduce their insulin doses excessively and cut back on the carbohydrate, which is prone to exacerbate diabetic ketoacidosis or the development of ketosis. So that this approach of, um, if it becomes 
uh, problematic and the patient becomes developing diabetic fibroacidosis, to stop the SGLT2 inhibitor or SGLT inhibitor to um, provide insulin therapy and to enhance carbohydrate uh, into the system and to hydrate individuals by drinking water. If that doesn't work, obviously they need to go to the emergency room for appropriate therapy. So the pre prevention of DKA with SGLT inhibitors, again, it's most commonly unable to eat or drink. Um, you should uh, avoid the SGLT2 inhibitors I just stated. Uh, the patient is, um, if the patient is going for surgery, uh, gets a viral illness, um, for example, uh, going to have a colonoscopy, or is NPO for any reason, you should stop the SGLT inhibitor. Uh, individuals, if they're on insulin and SGLT do not, an SGLT inhibitor, do not stop the insulin. That's the biggest problem because a lower insulin in the face of SGLT2 inhibitors can potentiate the development of ketosis and potential ketoacidosis. If nausea, the patient becomes nauseated or sick in any way, you should hold the SGLT inhibitor and uh, troubleshoot their insulin delivery and check their blood urine ketones frequently um, to prevent them from developing full of long ketosis and ketoacidosis. If the ketones are positive, then the patient uh, should take insulin for protocol. Um, unable to eat or drink, go to the emergency department for fluids and further management. We do not uh, suggest that uh, SGLT inhibitors be prescribed for patients with poorly controlled diabetes or who are non-compliant. They are very high at risk of developing DKA, um, and so they would not be uh, considered to be appropriate candidate for use of SGLT inhibitors. The best approach is a multidisciplinary team-based approach where intensive therapy has been extensively carried out by a team of diabetologists, dietitians, behavioral therapists, and the time, effort, and cost um, were considerable. But um, this approach uh, is most likely to have beneficial effect and to minimize the side effects that would occur with the use of SGLT inhibitors as a de adjunctive therapy to insulin in the management of type 1 diabetes. So just to summarize um, and to give the conclusion, subjects with type 1 diabetes are becoming increasingly overweight and obese. This affects the amount of insulin that they uh, need, uh, often uh, increasing the insulin resistance. and uh, and then requires and increases the need for adjunctive therapy. Most type 2 diabetics, um, most, type, most type 2 diabetes maladies, oral or injectables do not help patients oh, with type 1 diabetes. So there are a large number of therapies, both injectables and orals, that are beneficial for type 2 diabetes. Most of them are not beneficial the type one. The behavioral therapy, um, optimizing nutrition and physical activity can be helpful. Adjunctive therapies, the SCLT inhibitors may help by uh, neutral to lowering hypoglycemia, to translating to some weight loss, reducing the insulin doses, improving insulin resistance, and in, if they do they do so at the increase, at the expense of a slight, but significant increase in DKA, which should be recognized and monitored for and treated accordingly. Uh, again, the, the need for multidisciplinary team-based approach for optimal control of, di of glucose uh, in type 1 diabetes and when adjunct therapy is used uh, to prevent the development of diabetes ketoacidosis. Additional data um, 
will be forthcoming in uh, in the management, the optimal management of patients to prevent TKA um, in future meetings. Thank, thank you for participating in this program. Please complete the post-test and evaluation to receive your CME credits.